background is, well, I used to do a PhD in statistics, but then I moved to the dark side, uh, and I'm working now more or less in finance. And finance, I'd say, is probably the discipline of economics, and I would say we are a sub-discipline that really builds the most quantitative models and very sophisticated models, but constantly fails to predict anything. And, uh, <laughs> but we, we, found a, we found a very good way of... Um, well, overcoming the problems of, of failures in prediction, and that's the efficient market hypothesis. So that says the price you observe for any asset in the, at the moment is a fair price. It's the best price that contains all the available information. And so if this is the price, and just on a side note, I mean, how could you possibly forecast unless you have information about the future? So even our failures in, in, in finance have not really led to <laughs> rethinking. Uh, but, I mean, that will not be the topic of this talk today. I'm, I'm, I'm talking far more about um, how we've designed systems to, um, well, put a price on carbon. I'm mainly going to talk about a carbon tax and, and the European emissions trading scheme or emissions trading system. And, well, it's history in this sense only refers to the last 10 years, I'd say. And it's a relatively short history. There are some successes, in my opinion. There also are some failures. And um, I will also give an, a relatively positive outlook, I'd say. Because my focus is more on the electricity sector. And I wouldn't say they've done very well in the past, but I think the, the outlook, and you will see that in, in the end when I talk about other developments, um, I think that will actually be relatively positive. Okay, so um, what is this about? Well, of course, I'm going to talk about the Kyoto Protocol. I said about the uh, emissions trading system, uh, carbon tax, and uh, I'll provide some conclusions. To start with a quote, uh, and I think that also ties in, in, in very beautifully with uh, what John was just uh, talking about. I mean, we're all aware that we're facing a challenge uh, to ride this storm. We need all hands on deck, and, and I mean, they're pretty gloomy. Uh, and do me uh, scenarios, but I think the second point is probably more important because uh, we're talking about a, a new setup uh, also in our economic thinking and, and, and this is what is mentioned here by Christiana Figueras uh, who says this is the first time in the history of mankind that we are setting ourselves the task of intentionally within a defined period of time to change the economic developments models that has been reigning for a very long period of time. What was that model? Well, it was all about uh, progress, growth, uh, exploiting natural resources, and we're really entering a time now, and I find that it's, it's very exciting where we have a, a model of constrained growth. Yeah, not growth at all, by all means, but we, 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 we talk about growth, and at the same time, of course, the, the key constraint is to reduce carbon emissions. And, and pretty much this talk is going to, to be about what have people tried and has it worked or has it not worked. Um, here, just uh, to give you a background um, about some of the culprits, and it's, it's nice that there's so many people from the US and of course we're in Australia, because this is among the, the, the biggest per capita uh, polluters in the world. And, I mean, per year, the numbers, well, these are from 2011. Some people said in 2012 uh, you would get anything between 18 and 25 tons of CO2. And, and to give those people who were flying in a guilty conscience, yeah, if you were flying in from Europe, uh, you've already uh, contributed 17 tons of CO2. So you've, you've done quite well if you compare yourself to what the average person in Iran or, or, or India or in other country actually pollutes. So it's really us, and I'm a very bad part of it as well because I'm flying up and down to Europe a lot, uh, who, who contribute yeah, to this uh, CO2 pollution. Okay, so I think we all know pretty much, or oh, we've heard about the Kyoto Protocol. I mean, I just want to emphasize one point here, and I, and I think, I mean, this goes back to 1997, and, and it's quite interesting. It's already based on the premise, yeah, in 1997, well, global warming exists, and it's man-made. And, and, you know, there's a lot of debate about uh, 
well, not that much debate anymore, I'd say, but uh, climate change deniers would, would probably argue, well, this is not necessarily true, but this is really one of the foundations, of course, of the uh, Kyoto Protocol, and then here I'm giving some numbers, uh, I mean, 4.2% reduction in comparison to 1990. Uh, in terms of CO2 emissions. There's a new plan, for example, the European Union has decided to reduce carbon emissions by 20% in comparison to 1990 by 2020. But I'll come to that later on. There's a relatively flexible mechanism. So uh, this, this carbon reduction uh, can be implemented through different mechanisms. And uh, one is, the, of course, the emissions trading scheme. Uh, and the others are so-called project-based mechanisms, what a clean development mechanism and joint implementation where you get your carbon credits through projects that could be in non-Annex 1 countries or in Annex 1 countries. But I'm mainly going to talk about the first mechanism here, and that's the emissions trading scheme. Okay, so let's have a look uh, at the European uh, Union emissions trading system. Um, Here's just the timeline, and, and I think it was actually, uh, there has been a lot of criticism towards it, but I think they got definitely one thing right, and that was to have this pilot trading period to start off with uh, three years uh, of trading to learn, because if you think of, uh, well, humans as uh, being rational and, and, and trying to be uh, making the most uh, out of anything, any scheme that you can design, uh, you will see that this has actually also happened with the European uh, emissions trading scheme, that uh, there were windfall profits, manipulations, uh, a lot of things were going wrong in my opinion, so I think it was very good to have this pilot trading period, then we had the first Kyoto commitment period, and currently this is the second Kyoto commitment period that will go until 2020. So what is actually traded there? Well, it's one ton of CO2. Remember, flying from London to Sydney, 17 tons of CO2 emissions. Um, or if you drive a car approximately for 3,000 kilometers, you would emit one ton of CO2. Then where a lot of installations were uh, affected by this scheme, uh, more than 10,000, of course, pri uh, predominantly the electricity sector because the electricity sector or the energy sector typically contributes around 70% of CO2 emissions and uh, electricity production is around 50%. So there were national allocation plans, so the, the first step what had to be done was basically to determine what were the emissions in 1990 or for some countries it was also set in 2000. And then based on that there were these allocation plans for each participating country and if you failed, if a company or market participant, of course they didn't participate voluntarily, uh, but if they failed to, to uh, have enough permits, they would be punished by a sanction payment of 40 euros and they would still have to deliver the additional permit in the next period. And now for the current Kyoto commitment period, it's 100 euros. So relatively expensive. If we look at the prices, and, um, well, maybe you focus on the blue line here, that is the so-called spot price. I mean, what, what have they done through this market? They've created an artificial, we call it asset, yeah, like a stock or a share with a price. Some people argue it's a factor of production, yeah, like oil, like coal or uh, whatever. Um, but the reality, of course, is it is a completely made up factor of production. Yeah, you had to possess this uh, unit to uh, uh, pollute the air with, with CO2. If you look at the prices, I mean, actually, and I haven't plotted the first price, it was around 8 euros, then the prices went up to a price range around 30 euros. And then that was already the first event uh, uh, that impacted significantly. Well, there was news. Oh, by the way, there have been over allocations in some countries. Some countries hadn't been honest about the actual uh, CO2 emissions previously, have been allocated too many emissions. Well, of course, what is going to happen if the whole market knows there's more than enough, prices will drop. But it was quite surprising that at that time the price didn't go straight to zero. But so this leakage of information didn't convince everyone. Prices went like to 8 euros, 10 euros, then they went up a little bit, but then it became more and more clear that basically there would be more, far more than enough uh, permits. And what does that mean? 
if, you, if everybody has more than enough of these permits, you're not going to pay anything for it. the price went to zero. And that's why I'd say it's, I mean, this is from 2005 to 2007, I think this is why I say it's probably very good that they had a pilot trading period, because there was a learning effect. Yeah, so there was an oversupply. Um, it is very difficult when you set up those schemes to really predict what future emissions are going to be, and it is very difficult to get correct information, because there will always be lobbying, uh, wrong information, and that's really what happened in the first phase. Well, very bad, on the other hand, was that these allowances were given out for free to the electricity sector. But what did they do? I mean, you saw these prices, around 20 euros. Well, more or less immediately, at least the electricity sector in Germany um, added those 20 euros to electricity prices. So basically, consumers paid because they would argue, yeah, well, that's the price of, of, uh, of one ton of CO2, and uh, electricity prices have to go up. But in fact, they got the permits for free. And I mean, there has been a lot of literature about these so-called massive windfall gains. And uh, I think this is also a lesson to learn. I mean, oh, two things, certainly. If, if there's a chance to undermine the system or make profit out of it, unfortunately, and, and that's a very gloomy view, I'd say, but companies will try to do that. And, and countries might also try to do that. So it is very difficult to set this up the right way. Okay, then there were changes, and I don't want to go too much into detail. Well, uh, there's a further reduction in emission allowances. Uh, as I said, 20% uh, by 2020. Um, more and more permits were not given away for free anymore, not grandfathered anymore, but were now auctioned off. And things seem to work a bit better in phase two, and we've already entered phase three, but prices haven't really changed too much uh, since the end of 2012. Uh, as you can see, same game again in the beginning. The industry was scared, was buying permits for a relatively high price, 25 euros. In the long run, prices went down, but they didn't go to zero this time. Yeah, they went somewhere around five euros. I checked. Uh, today, currently, the price uh, for, uh, for EUA, you know, for permit, is around 8 euros. And is this what people expected? I remember when this was set up, they would rather say, well, we're thinking of somewhere between 15, 30, 35, up to 40 euros. That hasn't really happened. And, and a lot of people in Europe, therefore, argue, well, it's been a failure. But I wouldn't say that's, that's necessarily true. Yeah, I mean, in some sense, I'm sure it has been a failure, but, but they have overachieved the reduction commitment, no doubt about that. Um, GDP has grown substantially, of course, because it's all about growth, uh, but emission reductions uh, have been around 17%, 18%, even more in, in 2015. I mean, we don't have the numbers yet. A share of renewable energy has increased uh, tremendously. It's now, uh, well, 24% of uh, primary energy production. It's significantly less for consumption, but um, still uh, pretty, uh, for electricity consumption, but still pretty high. And, and if you look at it, there was a growth of 85% almost in renewable energy. And that's, of course, that's substantial. Um, so you could argue, well, this has almost been a success. And at least it has achieved, and, and I spent some time at the European University Institute uh, two years ago in, in Florence, and they have a huge group working on that, and they would just say, well, look, we have achieved, or the scheme has achieved what we wanted. Could, if, could it have done better? Maybe we could have done even better if, if the targets were much tougher. But that was not possible to push that through politically. So in, in some sense, it is probably more of a success than a failure. Costs have been argued, and that's Im almost impossible to estimate, but economists will still do it um, and come up with a number. Can we trust it? I don't know. But a uh, fraction 1% of GDP, that is relatively cheap. It was argued it would be much higher. Well, but there's also some critique. And this is by UBS investment research who said, well, look, you could have done this much cheaper if you had actually invested in, um, in uh, upgrading the power plants. Well, maybe, but do we think that would have happened? I doubt it. Yeah, that, that is always uh, the question, because if, unless there's a force or uh, companies are forced to change or uh, people are forced to, to uh, pollute less, I think it's not going to happen. 
So overall, the EU ETA is not so bad. Let's have a look at the, the Australian carbon tax now. Of course, I've shown you the graph, and Australia is among the worst uh, polluters uh, per capita in the world. Of course, it's a relatively small country. So um, you could say it doesn't matter that much uh, in the overall worldwide uh, carbon emission. Uh, emission intensity in the, and I should have said, that the NEM is the National Electricity Market, and I'll show that in one of the next slides, is 0 0.9 tons of CO2 per megawatt hour of electricity. I mean, now, what is a megawatt hour? Well, it's just the unit that is traded in the market. Typically, we are charged by a kilowatt hour, so this is 1,000 uh, kilowatt hours. Um, if you compare this to Europe, the, uh, the emission was much less, as, uh, for example, 0 0.4 tons of CO2. And over the last five years, that was actually in 2013. Yeah, so it might have even changed more. And if you look at the different markets in Australia, uh, some of them are very dirty. For example, Victoria, mainly fired by brown coal. And then there's Tasmania, uh, mainly, uh, where electricity is mainly generated by hydropower. So uh, they have a much lower CO2 emission. OK. so. What happened? Well, most of us know, of course, about uh, at least everyone in Australia. I guess it was so much debate about that. There was the so-called clean uh, energy bill, a, a two-stage uh, mechanism. Started with a carbon tax in 2012 of $23. Remember, at that time, the, the price in the EU was approximately 6 euros. So this was, well, what was the exchange rate? Let's say in those days, it was roughly between 8 and $9. Yeah, so that was quite a statement to put it to $23. Uh, and then it was supposed to go to $24.15 and $25.40. Um, of course, we know it didn't make it uh, that far because it had been abolished in uh, 2014. So we only had two years of, of a carbon tax, but that still gives us some chance to look at what has actually happened to the electricity market during, those, during this period. And, and give me... I just apologize to those from, from Western Australia, uh, but they have their own market. I've never looked at that. <coughs> uh, so this is the national electricity market. We have those five regions, New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, and Victoria. And Tasmania is connected to Victoria through an uh, underwater cable. Um, so. Uh, if you look at the Australian market, but that might not be so relevant, but uh, the electricity is relatively cheap, or used to be relatively cheap in Australia. 2.5% uh, uh, or 2.4% of the income spent on your electricity bill, uh, that is significantly less than in many other countries. And, but at the same time, and we never hear about that because we pay a fixed price, at the power exchange, electricity is traded on an exchange, every half an hour you get a price, and those prices vary from minus $1,000 up to $13,500. Why would there be a negative price? Well, uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense for the generators to shut down their power plants and ramp them up again, so basically they are paying in that market for someone to buy or to, to consume the electricity. But that's a very rare case. But at the same time, if you think it goes up to 13,500, so this is extremely volatile. And, and the, well, who pays the price in the end for this volatility? It's typically the, the, the consumers, because this is charged by the retailers to us in the end, because the retailers have to buy there. But anyway, that's a different story. We are more interested in looking what did the carbon tax really do to those prices. Um, this is just a, a graph showing you how electricity is actually generated in our, like, well, it's a share, and of course it's predominantly, as we all know, black coal and brown coal. Then there's some uh, combined gas uh, or cycle uh, gas turbines, uh, some thermal gas, a little bit of wind, and, and other, but I mean, easily you can see that more than 80% typically comes from coal. And of course, that's due to, because coal is extremely cheap. Um, but what I wanted to show you, and that, uh, try to keep that in mind, this is kind of the so called supply stack or the merit order. This just tells you, depending on how much electricity is demanded in the market, what should roughly be the price. Yeah, and, and, and basically, it starts with the cheap production or generation, that's uh, brown coal and black coal, 
Yeah, they produce uh, electricity for whatever, three, four, up to $20 per megawatt hour. And then the more expensive uh, other generation types come in. Okay, so this was before the tax. Yeah, and typically, I should probably point that out, very often the demand in the market is only around here, maybe here, but sometimes it jumps up here. That's typically during the so-called peak load periods. Okay, now let's have a look at what will happen after the tax. Well, of course, coal will become much more expensive if you add the price of the carbon tax. But still, in comparison to the other energy generation uh, or power plants, it, it is still the cheapest source. So what does that mean? If we have high demand, yeah, this whole thing works like an auction. So the price that actually is charged is always whoever bids into the market, for example, here. So it would be the yellow price here, whatever, $65. And during peak periods, you often get those prices. But then for those prices, it doesn't matter at all whether there's a carbon tax in place or not. It only matters down here. Here it was cheaper, and then due to the carbon tax, well, everything moves up. And I'll, I'll comment on that later on. Um, again, so these are the emission intensities. As I said, Victoria pollutes a lot per pro uh, uh, megawatt hour of electricity. New South Wales and Queensland also, South Australia and Tasmania the least. And maybe I should just go quickly through that, but just to show you how the prices of electricity were impacted, this is the spot price. As I said, sometimes it jumps up to $1,000. And you just, I zoom in here, to show you how the tax has really affected the prices. Yeah, this was before the tax. We get the tax effect. We get the after-tax effect. And, well, that would be expected. But the question is by how much. If we look at emission intensities, of course, what was the major aim of introducing uh, the carbon tax? Well, it was to reduce emissions. And if you look at this, and I plotted this in a very nice graph, I don't know whether you can see the numbers, but I've almost like, if I plotted this uh, on a different scale, you would see that there was hardly any change. I mean, emissions seem to go down a little bit during the carbon tax period, what would be from here to here, but, but overall, they were already going down anyway. I mean, the effect was really very small, unfortunately. And the same, well, here you see this break, so in, in Victoria, they went down, and now they went up a little bit. But, uh, but the effect was probably not what people would have expected. And, and what happened to the prices at the same time? Well, if you have a look, probably I shouldn't bore you with that model. I wanted to impress you. <laughs> but it's not even that complicated. No, anyway, I mean, basically what we're doing here, we're trying to, to have a look how did the tax, because, I mean, the price of electricity is mainly determined by demand. Yeah, the higher the demand, the higher will be the price, because the more expensive power plants we have to add. Yeah, to, so if we end up here, we get a higher price. If we only have a low demand, we can do it all with coal, in theory, and it will be cheaper. Okay, so if we look, and, but that gives us a chance to, to see how did actually, what did actually happen. Yeah, and the blue dots of prices are the ones before the tax. The red ones are the ones during the tax, and the green ones are the ones after the tax. And you can already see here, I mean, this is clear, prices went up. But it's a pretty nasty thing, and, and, and this is, for me, more or less impossible to explain, because prices of, of, of resources have not gone up uh, since, I mean, they've actually gone down. Uh, and that's why Australia is close to a crisis, or as what some people would suggest, um, you would not expect that electricity prices after the tax remain that high. Yeah? And, they are, and the green ones are clearly above the blue ones. And then some people say, well, there's stickiness in prices. Uh, it's an economic concept. But it doesn't make sense, because nothing has really changed. So what, what really had happened, there was a tax, prices went up, and since then they've remained interestingly relatively high. Okay, now let's look at how much have they actually gone up. If they were just passing through the carbon tax, we would have to multiply by this emission intensity and we would get these kind of numbers. 
Yeah, $21 increase, 19 in Queensland, 13, and so on. Well, the reality was, I mean, it should be much less than that, but uh, uh, the reality was, it was even more. Yeah, prices went up even more than by passing this tax just through 100%. Uh, prices went up on average in uh, New South Wales around $28, in Queensland by $35, uh, and so on. Yeah, in Tasmania, you wouldn't expect any increase, but uh, that is a, a, a mechanism going on that people from Victoria bought electricity in Tasmania because in relationship to the dirty, electricity was actually more uh, cheaper than. But anyway, also very bad is this post-tax increase yeah, because there is not an obvious reason for getting these extreme prices or these prices being still so high. And I'm not talking about the prices we pay as consumers because they are also a product of a transmission costs, uh, investment into infrastructure and all those things. Yeah, the main uh, increase in electricity prices is due to those things, but this tells you that something is going wrong and I can't, cannot really explain it and I don't think anybody could really give a, a true and honest account that how this can possibly happen, or it shouldn't happen. Yeah, so in, in that sense, um, now this is the same for, for peak load. It's even worse because remember when I said when the demand is high, the carbon tax basically doesn't matter because they would have already produced electricity from some of the expensive generation and they don't use uh, pollute a lot. So this is even a worse outcome than what could be expected. But it's also interesting, I mean, spot prices yeah, at this market um, they are a product of many things. Yeah? There could be something going wrong, uh, generation capacity could have been withdrawn by shutting down a power plant, but there's also futures contracts. They give you an idea, basically I could make a contract with you, um, well, that would be a forward, but anyway, uh, of buying whatever, one million euro from you in one year's time. And then there's financial markets where you can exchange these kind of contracts and there's also financial markets where you can exchange uh, electricity in the future. Yeah, so I'm going to buy whatever one megawatt hour of electricity over the next year from you. And this is the price for this. And you can see that as soon as, I mean this was in 2011, uh, this is for New South Wales, as soon as it became clear that the carbon tax would be passed, prices went up immediately. So the electricity sector had reacted more or less immediately, or if you look at uh, um, another graph, uh, this is basically also from 2010 up to, it goes the other way around, and I'm not going to go too much into detail while you have to plot it this way, but you should, uh, uh, up to July 2012. And this is just how the electricity sector reacted until the introduction of the tax. So the market, as soon as they hear something is going to change, there will be an immediate reaction and it will be passed on, uh, or basically it will come through the price where this asset is traded. A quick look at 2013-14, because there's also some work uh, I've been doing, I find it quite interesting. I mean, if you look at, we all know the situation, in, uh, for those of us in Australia, I mean, um, yeah, Labour had been ruling for uh, five years, uh, or six years, and um, of course the candidate was uh, of the centre-right coalition was uh, Tony Abbott. He's not prime minister anymore. But uh, and uh, the <laughs> the potential climate change denier, by the way, I think. But anyway, we don't want to go there. Um, uh, Julia Gillard was the the other candidate. Uh, uh, sorry, okay. So in those days, Trudeau Gillard was the Prime Minister, Abbott was the candidate. Um, it didn't look good for the Labour government, so they replaced her uh, with Kevin Rudd, and suddenly there was a swing uh, in, in, the, uh, in the quotes for uh, who would be uh, the ruling after the election, and um, in the opinion polls, that's what I meant to say. And you can see all these things in the electricity market. And that is really, uh, I found that quite astonishing. If you have a look at the futures prices, yeah, this was basically, remember the carbon tax was $23. In those days, the electricity sector already more or less believed that the tax would probably be abolished. So there was only a premium of roughly $10. 
Then there was a swing in the opinion, uh, opinion polls towards labor, suddenly the premium went up again. Then it became more and more clear that uh, the new government would actually be uh, the coalition. Prices didn't go down to, or the premium didn't go down to zero because first they had to make sure that they really abolish uh, the tax, but then you can just see the market more and more believes in it, and in the end it's, a, it's around zero. So, so the market more or less uh, reacts immediately to these regulatory changes or political news and, and the electricity market is also one piece of information where, where you can see how the financial sector works. Okay, so what would be the summary for Australia? Well, the carbon tax did not really have a substantial effect on reducing emission intensities. Uh, the price increase was far more than what it should have been based on these pass-through costs we would have expected. And the worst thing is probably the price still remained at a relatively higher level after the tax. So if you look at this, you would probably say it was rather unfavorable outcomes for, for consumers and has not really achieved the goals. Um, and, well, the last point was just this illustration how financial markets react more or less immediately or in a very uh, quick way to, to news. On the other hand, of course, what has the carbon tax done? And, and if you look at the, the increase in renewable energy in, in Australia, that has actually been quite substantial recently. And I think in, in that sense, it was a success because the industry knows they have to change. Uh, a lot of uh, investments in renewables have happened. And, and I believe, uh, well, it probably cost a lot. Uh, it was probably because there was not enough political power to, to force electricity generators to well, give a fair price, I'd say, um, to, uh, to push it through or to, to, well, I'd say make it fair for consumers. But in the end, probably it has significantly contributed to increasing the share of renewable energy. So now for the last six minutes, yes. Uh, by the way, it's very nice. Uh, they are showing Dr. Phil here, and here <laughs> I, can, I can see the, um, the time. So uh, a rather positive or optimistic outlook, I'd say. Well, why do I believe that? And I mean, of course, this is more an opinion, and, and it uh, cannot really prove that. But if you look at the, also at the literature on, on electricity markets and, and the energy economics literature, you would see there's far more work now on the inclusion of renewable energy sources into the electricity sector, into the energy sector, and, and I will come to that on the next slide. Uh, there are substantial technological uh, changes happening, and I think the electricity sector will completely be transformed over the next 10 to 20 years, and that is really good news, I think. Um, well, the second one, political will to act more rigorously, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. I mean, that's... Yes or no? We'll hear more about it, I think, from Leslie Hughes tomorrow, who was just in Paris at the uh, COP21. Uh, and um, I think in the last point is because my area is mainly finance, I can tell that the financial sector is very scared about uh, uh, carbon pricing and the, the impacts on how they could suffer from this. And there's a lot of research currently going on in that area as well. So just some points. Well, what will happen to electricity markets? Well, they, um, as I said, I believe there will be extreme changes due to, um, well, there will be more so-called interconnected uh, capacity. It will be easier to transfer electricity between uh, the Australian states or in Europe between the countries. Uh, we'll have developments like smart grid. There's, there's a lot of work being done on so-called demand curtailment, like just shutting off uh, uh, potentially your production facilities or us as consumers with an app shutting off our fridge or whatever when electricity prices are high, demand will be reduced immediately and, and I think we will, we will really move toward a much flatter profile in demand and, and that will also mean that prices will become much cheaper, at least they should. Uh, and, and the last point of course, and that's probably also a key point is energy storage. If, if we have an, uh, because the problem of course at the moment is the wind blows when it wants to, uh, the sun shines uh, whenever, and, and this electricity is fed into the market right away. 
and but that makes it difficult to use those resources when well when there's no wind or when there's no sun but with energy storage and this is becoming much cheaper over the last couple of years and that's why I'm saying 10 to 20 years it will probably really be a feasible solution and that will change the entire landscape if we all have uh, storage facilities to store renewable energy that has been produced whatever at night when when the wind was blowing and then use it during the day um, I think this sector will not exist the way it used to exist uh, in 20 years. The, the, and, and I mean, that also makes most of the research I've done over the last 10 years uh, kind of, well, useless. But it's also exciting times uh, because there will be new research and, and uh, well, we have to work on that. Um, I believe that all these innovations will make it relatively easy uh, to achieve substantial carbon emissions because renewable energy will be, it will just be possible to feed that into the system in a relatively easy and, uh, well, in uh, a huge manner. On the other hand, I mean, I've also done some work and all, well, other people have done even better work on that. If you look at the renewable energy company sector, um, they have performed quite well in the beginning of the 21st century, but at the moment or in the last since the uh, financial crisis, they've really been struggling. So people call it the valley of death between innovation and development and then really making it uh, economically sustainable or viable. And, and this somehow needs to be overcome and, and that's probably where the government policy, uh, policies have to support uh, the renewable sector. But overall, this, I mean, in this case, innovation and, and, and new technology is a great thing and, uh, for, for the electricity sector. Um, well, with regards to the political landscape, I'm, I'm just arguing from how many additional uh, emission trading schemes seems, uh, I mean, they seem to pop up. Uh, China is now really, of course, is one of the major polluters, keen on uh, setting up their cap and trade scheme in 2017. And for them, of course, it, it was of great help. Uh, to see those mistakes that have been made in Europe, to see what worked, what didn't work. Uh, India has also set up a mandatory energy efficient trading scheme. So there is a lot of political will in my opinion. Well, or maybe they're all pretending. That's of course hard to, hard to judge, but it seems like a lot is really happening in that area. And that also makes me probably rather optimistic. And I don't know how much time I have left. Well, maybe I'll just show this, uh, this slide. I mean, also the financial sector, the, the bad guys, yeah, are, um, are actually getting very worried about hedging climate risk. And I think this is also a result of the political climate. Uh, because they think something has to be done and that will also affect the financial sector. Not so much because they're polluting. I mean, they're, uh, this is not really by what they will be measured, but they hold shares in their portfolio. And what, what means if you hold shares, you, you have a share of a company. Yeah, so basically, they're owners of polluting companies. And, and there's currently a lot of work being done on, on looking at uh, how will this whole thing transform the financial <coughs> sector? How will it transform how we invest? Uh, and and um, the major Australian banks, but also many other banks, already uh, report so-called uh, shadow price on carbon for their business operations. Uh, of course, the insurance industry has a self-interest to, uh, uh, to reduce the impacts of climate, uh, climate change. And there, there's two channels where people talk about the so-called asset channel and the reputation channel that will also change the financial industry with regards to, uh, uh, to carbon pricing. And this just means that financial companies will look more and more also at the carbon footprint of the companies they're holding in their portfolio. And they will also design their investment uh, in a way to potentially make sure that they will not be hit too badly if companies that pollute a lot are punished. Yeah, so, but this is really research that has just started, but I think this will also dominate, or well, maybe not dominate, but will be a key aspect of research in financial economics over the next year, 10 years or so. The other, of course, and that's more straightforward, is a reputational channel. If you are, a brand mark is uh, holding a lot of uh, polluters or polluting companies in, in your portfolio as a financial company or, or supporting them, giving them loans, bonds, well, that might have a reputational effect. 
And uh, so stakeholders could force the financial industry to, to also reduce their CO2 footprint. But that's probably really work for, uh, that has to be conducted in the future. Finally, let's just summarize, and yeah, it's down to zero now. Um, well, cap and trade programs, in, in theory I'd say a great idea, but they have to be planned very, very carefully. Yeah, I, I'd say phase one in, in Europe was and, and, well, pretty much of a failure. Phase two and three, well, they have certainly achieved to, uh, to reduce uh, carbon emissions, uh, but still, maybe they could have done better, but that's always hard to say. Okay, what about um, Australia? Well, it seems like the, the, the carbon tax has not achieved a significant reduction in emission, but still a reduction, and uh, and recently, there has been this growth in renewables. Can we uh, attribute that to the carbon tax? That's probably difficult to say, but certainly it has contributed to a change in the way we think about energy consumption and, and the, the political climate. Um, industry, watch closely the regulatory environment yeah, and the market. If you look at financial markets or economic markets, uh, they react very, very quickly to uh, political changes. And as I said, my outlook, at least for the electricity uh, industry, is very positive. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether it will be good news for electricity generators. I mean, they have to completely adjust their business model, um, I guess. But uh, in terms of pollution, I think uh, we will see reductions that, that uh, could be amazing uh, due to uh, and, and a substantial increase in renewable energy. All right, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you.